Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Beyond Our Reach. This is a two to four player card game that takes roughly 30 to 45 minutes to play and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game, humanity has went out into the stars and visited Genesis Prime. And in Genesis Prime, there are new planets. And with new planets comes new costs for missions and resources that are going to be required to complete them and secure a foothold in Genesis. You will go out and gather resources, obtain missions and complete them, launching them off and deploying them and being able to utilize them throughout the game. Once five missions have been completed by one player, each player is going to check to see who has the most victory points, and whoever has the most is the winner. Let's go ahead and take a look at how to set up the game, how to play, and of course, our review. To begin the game beyond our reach, the first thing you will do is give every single player a player board, and you will give them one white resource in their storage location. Then set up the main player area in which you're going to then take each of the different five decks of cards and place them on their areas. You'll have dropships, edifices, rovers, sentinels, and citadels. Based on the number of players playing the game, plus one is how many each of these decks is going to have. So if I am playing a three player game, I will take three plus one cards for each of the decks and I will put them down and make sure that they're shuffled. The rest of each of the cards are going to go into the mission deck area. So what it's going to end up looking like is having four decks of cards or five decks of cards of each of the different categories, as well as the main mission deck that is shuffled and put together so that there are a total of six different areas. The mission deck will remain face down while all the other decks are going to be flipped face up so that you can see the first mission of each type in each of the different deck spaces. Next, you're then going to be taking out contracts. There's a contract deck and based on the number of players in the game, plus one once again, you will be selecting those many cards and placing them face up within reach of all players in the play area. The rest of the contracts you will not be using for the game. Last but not least, go ahead and take the mission bag and place all the cubes that are not the four white cubes you start with into the bag and shuffle them up. Then select a player to begin the game and start it off. In the game, there are three main actions. You can draw cubes, you can plan by taking a mission card that's face up or one from the top of the deck here, or you can deploy. Deploying is placing a mission card from our prep area into our deployed area after you have the resources required on the card in order to do so. This is the main way you win the game. After five are set down on your field, that is the way that the game will end. In order to draw, you're going to take a number of cubes from this bag. Typically, it's going to be four cubes. You'll pull out four cubes, then you will select two of those cubes, placing them on either the cards on your field or in your storage area or in your trade area. And then the other ones you are going to place down on any of the five face up mission cards on the main game field. Once you have placed these down on the game field, that would end your draw action. The next action you can take is the plan action. This will allow you to take any card on the field or face down card on the mission area deck. If you select a card with cubes on them, when you gather said card, you are going to place it into your prep area. If you select a different prep area, it might have a prep fee, which you'll have to pay either with tokens or these cubes on the cards here or from your storage area. And then you will take the rest of the cubes and place them anywhere you'd like. You can mix and match them on other cards, but once you solidify cubes onto one of your cards, they will stay there forever. The only cubes that will move are cubes from your storage area, or once your trade areas are filled up, you can utilize them as a discount for any one color on your mission cards. Placing the cubes down based on the requirements of the cards will then solidify your turn and you'll pass. The last action in the game is you're able to deploy. To deploy slash launch, you will need to make sure that a card in your planning or prep area has all the required resources on it. When you do so, you will then take all of those cubes off, discard them into a pile outside of the bag, and place that mission card in your deployed area. The cards are going to give you a unique ability you can use once a turn, provided it's not the first turn that you launch it, and it's also gonna give you victory points in the upper uh, left-hand side of the card. 
Another thing to note too are these contracts. When you acquire enough contracts of the specific types on the left hand side of the card, you're going to score additional bonus points on the middle right hand side of the card. There's only a certain number of them though, so once they're gone, they're gone. And that's basically how you play the game. There is some nuance as well though. When you pull from this bag, you might end up getting a brown or gray cube, I should say, in which case these are called corruption. If they ever end up uh, either being taken by you or uh, being given to you, you'll place them on your corruption track. And these guys will move when red cubes are drawn from the bag here. When a red cube is drawn from the bag, you're actually going to be placing it on this breach area. You'll place it on the top left hand corner and as they fill up, eventually you'll run into three of them, in which case you are going to have to refill. Any discarded cubes will go back into the bag. If for some reason you manage to fill up the entire breach, instead of a refill will be a reset, which means you will take all cubes off of the main area and you, as, a, as well as the discard and place them back into the bag. As a, and of course, corruption for each red cube you draw is going to move one space to the right on your corruption track. The only way you can get rid of them is if you pay the cost on the bottom right hand corner during your turn with resources from your storage and other places as well. If it ever hits your corruption repository, that's a space that's going to stay there with your cubes and you'll lose a point for each gray cube that you have. And that's pretty much how you play the game. There's some nuance there, of course. You have the trade area, where if you have three of any cube on that space, you can remove them to spend or for one discount of any type of resource. Most cards are gonna have a resource cost, like this uh, Legacy's Lost Throne is gonna cost a green, three blue, and two purple, and two white cubes. However, because you have this tech area filled in, you can go ahead and remove those three cubes and, for, and you can use one white. White is typically a wild or it's a very rare expensive resource that certain types of objectives will need. And that's basically how you're going to be getting these cubes. You'll be pulling them from the bag, placing them onto your cards, placing them into your trade area or your storage to try and accumulate enough of the tokens slash resources in order to launch said missions into your deployed area. And like I said, once somebody has five of these guys here, that is going to end the game. Check to see how many points you have based on the upper left hand side of each mission, as well as any contract cards you might have. And for every five resources that you're not allocating or using on something that has already been deployed, you score one bonus point. Whoever has the most is the winner of the game. This game is basically a resource gathering game. You have to determine where you want to place the resources you get onto your main game board and where resources will go onto the basically the player or the, the group area. Because when players take these missions, if they have lots of resources on them, they're going to gain a benefit. You might also end up drawing red cubes that will fill the, the breach up, which is going to cause a refill. It's also going to move corruption on your track. Typically things you're not going to want to have, but but eventually is needed because that's a way to fill the bag back up with resources once again. Uh, the gray cubes are corruption and typically speaking most players are going to utilize these tokens on very very valuable missions so when you take those missions you'll have to also take corruption which can lead you to losing points and because this is a low scoring game typically the most points you can get from a single mission is three maybe four points. Losing a point is going to cost you. These different types of missions have unique abilities throughout the game. One of them could be moving one cube from one of your mission cards over to another, which you typically can't do once you place them down. Or perhaps you can secretly view the top card from the mission deck, return it, or swap it with Legacy's Lost Throne. So you can simply go ahead and take this card, put it down here, and flop it, swap it over, and then you can place the resources on top. And there's a ton of different valuable objectives that you can meet uh, with the contract cards. Uh, you might be trying to go for specific missions based on their point value, but then you can score even additional points if you meet the requirements here. Like if you have one of each of the different building types, minus one, you can score two points. Or if you have two throne type missions, and one of any other type, you'll just score an extra bonus point. And these are very useful. These, because the game is so close, you'll actually want to kind of consider these things. You want to consider your objectives uh, and what you need to do in order to gain the resources you need for the higher cost missions. Whether you want to pick up missions that have a lower cost but a lower point total, maybe for the ability at hand that you can utilize. And because these abilities are used from turn to turn, they can be very, very powerful.
Also to note too, generally speaking, you only have two storage spaces. So the best action for you on the beginning of the game is probably to draw a mission because you can utilize those cards to place resources on them. But if you have already filled up your storage, the only place you can place your different types of resources are in the trade area. And for the trade area, it's a three to one trade. So most of the time you're going to want to make sure that you have enough spaces available when taking cubes from the bag. Uh, additionally speaking as well, when you want to place more missions down on your player board, there's a prep fee. After you've placed your first one, it's free. The second one is going to cost you a resource of any type on your board as long as you have it. And then the second one will cost you two resources. And it gets expensive after a while, especially because you're drawing four and choosing two. The corruption track is also expensive. And so taking gray cubes is going to cost you one. And you might not even have the right cube type when you pull the corruption from the cards. And each one of the different types of corruption is gonna cost a different color of the resources. Speaking of colors of resources, there is a variety of different colored cubes. There are five of them, and there is a ratio. There are more greens than blues, more blues than purples, more purples than yellow, and more yellows than white. And white are considered wild unless they are specifically on the card itself, in which case you have to have a white cube in order to deploy it. Overall, this game is a pretty standard, straightforward game where you're gathering resources, gathering missions, attaching resources to the missions, deploying them and scoring points, attempting to gather contracts, and ending the game with more points than anybody else. But there's a lot of flair to it. Avoiding the different types of corruption, making sure that you utilize your corruption correctly because when the breach happens or when the specific types of red cubes spawn, the nasty breaches, they can cause your track to go over and you can lose points that way. How you place cubes and where you place them on the missions is important because throwing a yellow cube on a card that does not have a yellow resource requirement is going to make a player have to actually think about when they want to actually take that card because maybe they don't have other cards that need it. And sometimes it's very beneficial. I can take these resources from this card here that might not have any resources of the type it needs and I can place them on a space that it actually does need. And then that can help you with launching other types of missions. And of course the actions. Each of these different missions has unique actions that you can use throughout the game. Ignoring prep costs is very nice. Being able to draw additional cubes, being able to draw cards in a unique way in the mission deck. And of course, if you don't want to use any of these cards, being able to draw from this mission deck, allowing you to score even more additional points. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward yet unique style of game that I actually haven't played before. This type of resource allocation I've kind of seen before, but it's done very differently than other games I have played. And I love the feel of being able to kind of increase my variety and complexity, but there's always a cost. And this game kind of has a cost to everything. If you like games that involve resource management, games that are pretty straightforward, the different types of actions that you can take with a variety of different choices and actions that you can add on when deploying your missions, and games that have beautiful artwork that feel like you're on a lost world or a lost planet trying to gather resources to complete these missions to solidify your claim from Earth onto your new area. It's really, really cool. Uh, you probably won't like this game if you don't enjoy management games. There's a lot of management that goes on. There's a lot of resource allocation that goes on. Understand the different mathematical variants between the cubes in the bag, where the cubes are placed on the missions, and whether or not you can utilize those cubes is rather important. And so it can become quite a thinker, especially as the game progresses. It's definitely better with more players, but it plays just fine at two, three, and four players. And it is a very enjoyable experience experience. Once you play once, you're going to want to play again and learn it because you'll get better and better as you go. And there you go, Beyond Our Reach. If you're interested, there's a link down below. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Beyond Our Reach. If you're interested, like I said before, go ahead and check the link. You can also go ahead and check the website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. There's a giveaway currently for Mindbug Beyond Evolution, where you can go ahead and win that game right now. There's also a live stream that we have every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST and every Wednesday on whatnot at 6 30 as well thank you guys so much for watching and as always i look forward to delving beyond our reach with you next time